There you go. That's how the Red Sox ended the series in Oakland the other night. And, you know, I noticed there even Kevin Euclid said they're finding a way to win right now. Little bit of doubt there in the voice because the last couple of games in Oakland, let's face it, weren't the most impressive victories in the world, especially when you win the first one nine to nothing against what amounts to a triple A team in the Oakland A's. In any case, it is Friday here on the baseball hour, and you know what that means. You know what that means, Jimmy Stewart. Round table. Round table. I yeah. Uh, Mass, would you say you sit at the head of the table? I guess I, I was just going to say, I, I don't know why the table has to be round per se. I suppose it's because everybody's then looking at each other mm-hmm. as opposed to a square table, but I think you could have the same sort of thing. So I was wondering if we could come up with some sort of more more creative, more clever uh, name for the program. But in any case, let's not uh, dilly-dally over that. Tyler Milliken is here. Matt McCarthy is here. We'll open up your phone lines right away. 617-779-0985. The Red Sox have not played since the last time we spoke. It was an off day yesterday. They will open up a three-game series against the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim tonight out in Anaheim. So here's what we're going to do. You've heard a lot from me this week during uh, the, the second week of the season, first full week of the season. So we're going to bring in these guys. We're going to have each one of them. I've asked each one of them to prepare what I've what you know, we typically call like an opening take or an opening statement. But in this case, I asked them both. I asked each of them to pull something out of these games that they found to be noteworthy. It could be about one player, could be about a facet of the Red Sox play, what have you, and then we're going to go from there. That's how we're going to start the show tonight. But again, we also want to hear from those of you out there. 617-779-0985. Matt McCarthy, you weren't here last week, so you go first. Well, Maz, actually, in typical uh, baseball hour in Felgren Maz fashion, I would like to defer my opening take oh. to Tyler Milliken because oh. I think he actually wants to get a little bit more in-depth to something that I want to say, too. McCarthy, I hate to say it, but I'm still logging in over here. Okay. So you want to go first? Okay, Matt, go first. I think the roster construction with this year's team is so much better. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good roster, but my pr- my primary takeaway from the first seven games of the season is they're not really beating themselves outside of that Saturday night game in Seattle. They are not really beating themselves, which they did a lot last year. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have the talent to compete. They're going to have the talent to be a playoff team. I'm not convinced about that. But the pieces fit. The pieces fit just a little bit better, and you see it in the field. They are a better defensive team than they were last year. I will definitively say they are a better defensive team than they were last year. I hope the pitching is better. I hope the starting pitching holds up. I I have my questions. I'm not convinced. But I am convinced they're better defensively because everybody is playing the position that they should. And for the last three years, you have not been able to say that about the Red Sox. You've had... In opening weeks, you've had Christian Arroyo in right field, Kike Hernandez at shortstop, Bobby Dahlbeck at first base, second base, shortstop, doesn't matter. Uh, Last year, uh, Justin Turner playing second base. How many times did you look at the Red Sox on a nightly basis and say, that guy shouldn't be there? They have nine guys who are playing their actual real positions. And that's so small, it's so minuscule. But after after the last three years of Red Sox baseball, it's refreshing. They have guys who are playing where they should. And as a result, I think they're five and two. I mean, what you're talking about matches quickly is that they're a functional baseball team. And for example, they have a real center fielder. Mm -hmm. It's not Jaron Duran who's learning the position at the big league level. And they don't have Franchi Cordero in the outfielder at first base or Christian Arroyo in right field. It's a functional big league club. Second base still bugs me. Yep. But that is a stopgap measure, at least until Grissom gets here. We'll see how good Grissom is, but I think your point is frequently overlooked all they really have now i say it's a basic thing but they ignored it they have representative players in the right place and that doesn't mean that they're good enough that doesn't mean they have enough talent but they haven't done that for three years they've had so many guys out of position it's amazing what happens if you just put a real baseball team on the field doesn't mean they're great doesn't mean they're outstanding but this is a real baseball team and that's refreshing tyler 
So, me and McCarthy were talking before the show. We both went with defense overall, but I give the stats to match what the eye test, I think, has been giving to everyone. Of course you do. So, if you go back to a year ago, right, we talked about it. Outs above average, they were negative 50. That was last in all of baseball defensively. Now, you talk about the worst defensive team of all time in the stat cast era. It's the Mets. They were negative 58 in 2017. So, that's how bad the Red Sox were a year ago. So, you're saying, you just to point out again, because the, the numbers can, sometimes can be really fast, okay? And not just for you, for everybody. Last year's Red Sox team rivaled historically uh, one of the worst baseball teams of the modern era. A hundred percent. There was no other way to frame it. That's how bad they were. You look at where they are through seven games right now. In terms of outs above average, they're sixth best with three. In terms of defensive runs saved, they're seventh best. In terms of fan graphs, defensive value metric, which is just kind of looking at the whole picture, eighth best. Now you go sit there and you talk about the eye test and you see the improvement. I think it does start with the guy in center field and Sedan mm-hmm. Rafaela. And I know you got a lot of heat this week, Maz, for talking about what you thought that catch was on Tuesday. A lot of people were talking about expected batting average. That doesn't tell you how hard a catch is. A lot of people think it does. It doesn't. That's exit velocity and launch angle. It just tells you when a ball's hit that hard at what angle, how often it's caught. Catch probability tells you how good of a catch it is. That Rafaela catch was 50%. So 50% of center fielders come down with that ball. And I think when you talk about Jaron Duran like we did, all right, he was always in that bottom 15 of center fielders. No one was going to confuse him for that upper half. When you bring in Rafaela, he's elite. So you're going to see catches like that. You're going to see what happened with Cal Rowley in Seattle where he caught a ball with a 35% catch probability. That's the stuff that kind of excites me and you see it differently. His success rate added this year is 10%. So 10% of balls the average outfielder doesn't get to, he gives you a 10% chance better of getting to those balls than the average guy than the average guy and that's where you kind of get excited because that's the 10th best mark in all of baseball you talk about getting Yoshida Yoshida out of left field Mm -hmm. you have Jaron Duran there who last year was 99th percentile outfield jump it all kind of levels up together and Tyler O'Neill gets overlooked in all of it he's won two gold gloves in his career and he's now part of this mix and I will say Emmanuel Valdez does scare me I think he's been a little bit better But another part of that little conversation, and it happened when Valdez had that play in the ninth inning uh, in the series finale where he threw the ball and it went away. On a double play. Yep, on a double play. Casas got off the bag and caught that ball. Last year, a big problem with me and Casas was if the ball wasn't right at him, it was rolling to the dugout. He's getting off the bag. The footwork is better over there. I think all that combines together to show the eye test and the numbers are all going in the right direction. Okay, so here's what I'll tell you, just quickly, because this is self-serving to me, as you pointed out. I want you to give that stat again on Raphael in center field, that the catch probability on the ball off the bat was what? 50%. And what does that mean? 50% of center fielders come down with that ball. Okay, I took some grief for this on Twitter, because I said a lot of major league center fielders make that play. So it's getting a little overhyped here. And again, I didn't have the numbers. I'm just telling you by what I saw. Okay, that a, ma- a major league center fielder makes that play. People thought I was being negative. Tyler's telling you half make it, half don't. Yep. Exactly my point. Exactly my point. That I And again, maybe it's not most, but I would say a good number of major league center fielders make that catch. The top half. Yeah. The so, better ones. Now, again, I don't think uh, that Jaron Duran was necessarily one of them. And you said the numbers also support that. Yeah, we know what Jaron Duran was a year ago. Even though he held his own, he was still a negative center fielder. Again, and, and again, in center field. Okay, in Duran and left, I like it. Much better. Now, he still can't throw. He's got a horrible throwing motion. Well, that's why putting him in right field, even in spring training, was terrifying to me. Never put him out there again. I mean, he can't throw. But there's no question the defense is better. Okay, now again, I don't know if it's elite. You know, Tyler, you said ranked anywhere from six to eight. But I would say overall, this all goes along with what you said, Matt, too. They're a functional baseball team. That's the word, functional. They throw strikes. They generally catch it. You know, now the offense has got some uh, distance to cover here because they haven't been great in the early part of the year. And if something's wrong with Devers, then I'm worried about that. They're in trouble. But... They have a legitimate major league first baseman. And let me just add this quickly before we go to break, that I love to give guys grief when they're out of shape. Kenley Jansen, out of shape. Frankly, I find it disgusting. If I'm going to do that, just in the interest of fairness, Tristan Casas looks like he's in excellent shape. Baby fat's gone. Excellent. He's really lost a lot of the, 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 the baby fat off his upper half. Okay, he looks like he's moving better. 
He still hasn't found his rhythm at the plate, but I'm not overly concerned about Casas because I think he can hit. But if he's lost weight and he can move better around the bag and on the bases, excellent. I don't think he's going to sacrifice anything offensively by being in shape. In fact, I think he's going to be better off for it. So just in the interest of fairness, it's noticeable he's in shape. I would say for the most part, they look to be in shape. So that's good. Again, the word I would use, functional. It's a functional baseball team. I still don't know how good they are. I still don't know, but they're in a good spot right now, and they can come home for the opener next week with a winning record of 7-3 and three or 8-2 and two if they don't take their eye off the ball this weekend. So that's where we're going to start. I see a couple of you online. Uh, Matthew in Florida, Joe in Lincoln. Don't go anywhere. We'll get to you when we come back. 617-779-0985 on the Baseball Hour.
there with yourself and say, this is what the team is. The roster is the roster, is what the quote was last year. Uh, yeah, I can find the entertainment value in it, but then you look over your shoulder and you're like, well, man, the Yankees have Aaron Judge. They have Juan Soto that they just had. Like, you get a little bit jealous. Like, I can, I can admit that now. Like, in the past, I would have been like, no, like, you know, I love the Red Sox and who cares about Juan Soto and Aaron Judge? Like, now I can be like, no, yeah, I, I, I wish that there were more stars on this team, but that's not to say I can't find the entertainment value in what I have. It's like, you know, it's, it's like being the poor kid on Christmas. It's like, you know, thanks, thanks for my little choo choo train, you know, but my friend just got this, you know, a new car for Christmas. It's like, wait, that's not the same thing. That's kind of where I'm at, where like, I'm, I'm trying to appreciate what I have, but I'm a little jealous. I'm a little bitter because I see what everyone else got for Christmas and I, I want that. That's Jared Karabas, Underdog Sports. Jimmy, what's it officially called, Underdog? Is it Underdog Sports or Underdog Fantasy? Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy. I just want to get it right. But in any case, you hear Jared say there, and I I, I don't want you guys to answer this yes. I, I, I don't want you to answer this yet. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let me control your answer. I don't want you to answer it yet. But there is a question as it pertains to the Red Sox, and what if they're good? What if they're good? Does that make do people get more excited, or do they get angrier that they didn't add to the roster during the offseason because they could have had a playoff year here? And maybe you still will. So, But don't answer that yet, okay? And let me just tell each of you, because I'm uh, Milliken, you probably already know this, Matt. I'm not sure you do. I'm reminding those of you out there that the Baseball Hour is now broadcast on the Sports Hub U- Sports Hub's YouTube channel. So, I don't know if you knew that, Matt. Got it right up here, Matt. Let's look okay, at that well, there beautiful you go. mug right there. <laughs> there you go. We are, we are on uh, the, and again, that is not YouTube TV. That is the Sports Hub channel on YouTube. You can catch a show there every night. We're going to bring in a couple of callers, and then I'll get back to uh, Tyler and Matt with the point that uh, Jared Carabas had. Matthew in Florida. Go ahead, Matt. Hey, um, first of all, hey, Tyler, rest in peace, Bullet. Thank you. And secondly, I just had a couple questions uh, to each of you. What can the Red Sox prove in this upcoming series against the Angels? And also, what do you think about trying to trade Kenley to a team that needs a closer? Because we have Liam Hendricks coming back. Maybe we can get a good bat to add to this lineup for Kenley from a team that needs a closer. Okay, let's answer, let's answer the first thing first. Okay, let's talk about the Angels. Anything in particular you're looking for in this series? I'm just looking for consistency. I think if you're looking at the Angels and saying, is this team going to prove something more than the Mariners did? No, the Mariners won 88 games last year and have one of the best rotations in all of baseball. The Angels, in all reality, they're kind of pegged in the same area as you, a team that's not going to make the wild card, especially without Shohei Otani. So just let me see consistency. I want to see three series in a row. I want to see the pitching continue to make the same gains, and it'd be nice if the offense woke up because this pitching staff is not very good for the Angels. Matt, yeah, you need to build on what you did in the first two series of the year, and I want to see you hit more than they have. I want to see this offense come to life a little bit. Uh, that's one of my biggest concerns with the team right now. But you should win this series. You know, you should be better than the Angels. This is not a particularly good baseball team. They've gotten out to a better start this year than most people probably would have predicted. Uh, but you should take two out of three from them. I mean, you got to keep winning. Keep winning. And look, at maybe you can look this up for me, Tyler, because you're, you're good at finding stats quickly. The uh, What was the Angels' ERA last year? Okay, and where did they rank? Because I, I, to me, I think they were one of the worst pitching teams in the league, and they had Otani on that staff. So this should be an opportunity for you to go into uh, Anaheim. I keep wanting to say L.A., but Anaheim. Uh, you know, bash the ball around a little bit, pitch around Mike Trout, don't let him hurt you, and get yourself another couple of wins and get out of Dodge. 12th in the American League with a uh, 4 6 4 ERA. Last okay, year. they sucked. They sucked. Their pitching staff sucks. They were projected to win 70 games. So don't go in there and now give, it a, give away what you built. Come home by taking two out of three and be seven and three or eight and two when you come home. You've got a chance to have a really successful road trip. Even worse, when you look at the entire picture, they had the 22nd worst ERA in all of baseball last year. Yeah, it's just it's not a good staff. It's a bad team. They've got one player, maybe a couple, but you get the idea. Go ahead. The only other thing I'll add, they've won four in a row. They kind of heated up after getting their heads beaten by Baltimore, so this is a team with a little momentum. Ron Washington met with them, had a closed-door meeting after the second game. So, okay, two teams riding with good momentum. Let the better team come out of it. Show that just because a team is garbage or, you know, even playing well, it's not going to get in the way of you. 
I mean, to me, that th- this should be a minimum two out of three. Now, again, I went into Oakland saying that initially, and the more I thought about it, I said, you got to take all three in Oakland after seeing that first game. I mean, the, the A's are, are, are worse than they were a year ago. They're horrible. That is as bad a baseball as I've ever seen on that on Monday night. Now you go into, uh, I'm, I'm willing to take a look at the Angels, see what they look like. Admittedly, there were some guys on their staff I don't know a lot about. But frankly, I think the Red Sox have more talent. And I think after the first two series of the year, we can look at them and say they're functional. They should be able to go up. They can continue to pitch the way they pitch. They should easily take two out of three in this series. You can always lose a game four to three. That can happen any night. But overall, if it's a big picture sport, give me two out of three, get home seven and three. Joe and Lincoln. Joe, what do you got? Hey, it's been a little long time since they called, Tony. It's first, first time I've followed the Red Sox since COVID. So that's a good sign right there. Yes. But I, I used to argue with you about defense. Remember Jackie Bradley and defending him. Um, I want to hear what the other guys have to say. To me, I wish there was a stat. I mean, I know they got these advanced metrics, but if, if they took uh, added a point to your RBI for every time that you saved a run and took it away every time you let, you let out a run in the field, I'd love that. But the thing I really want to say is that I think that it's what's overlooked is the effect defense has on pitching. If a pitcher is nervous about what happens when the ball gets hit in the field, he's going to tighten up, try to make a perfect pitch, try to strike everybody out, and that's going to be terrible for his pitching. So I think the pitching staff is going to relax and play much better with a good defense behind him. Joe, thanks for the call. Good to hear from you. All right, so here's a, well, first of all, good quickly. Yeah, I think you go back to the Tom Warner comment over the offseason, and it made me mad because it was more of a reason to invest, but he talked to someone in the front office, and he said, yeah, if we played better defense, I think we're eight or nine wins better. Did you see Nick Pavetta in that series finale, him going nuts watching them turn that double play? Because that's a guy who's been out there and has had to throw more and more pitches to get through outings. Brian Bayo, someone who would have really luck, rough luck with that defense the first couple years because so much was on the ground, and you have Kike Hernandez playing shortstop. Pitch count would continue to go up and up. If you want to work deep in games, you need to make outs when they're in front of you. I think that's why you're seeing guys like Whitlock really be in a much better position with this kind of defense behind him. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, defense and Milliken and I were talking about this before the show. You know, pitching can go up and down, right? You're going to have bad stretches through the rotation, but defense travels, right? You know, if you have good defenders, that should be pretty consistent over the course of 162. And it's an old school baseball adage, but I believe it to my core. You build teams up the middle. Now, they've got issues at second base right now. That's obviously because of an injury. But Wong is a good defensive catcher. Story's a really good defensive shortstop, and Rafael is a really good defensive center fielder. They have not had that for a while. They have not been strong up the middle. Those were not hallmarks of Heim Bloom teams. Uh, it's different now, and they're a better baseball team as a result. Well, so, and the, the confidence thing, like, I do believe there is a ripple effect when you play well defensively. Okay, so for example, the catch that Rafaela made on Tuesday night, Alex Cora was asked about it after the game. You know what he said? From my end, I knew he had it the whole time. Okay? Mm -hmm. And why? Because in spring training, Rafaela ran down everything. And because Cora Cora knew off the bat, this kid reads it, he can get there, this ball staying in the ballpark. And oftentimes you can tell by the way the outfielder moves. He's tracking it. And with Rafaela, you can see that right off the bat. He's tracking it. If it's in the ballpark, he's going to make the catch. And that's the kind of confidence he inspires. And also, Trevor Story. To be honest, I was pretty comfy about it just because I know he's out there. So this is exactly what the caller was talking about. He ran it down like he always does. That's the type of player he is, said Story. He's a game changer. He saved the game for us right there. Now, again, save the game. I, I thought it was a play that a good center fielder will make in Major League Baseball. Tyler has the numbers to back that up. But if you're telling me there is a ripple effect on the pitching staff, when you have good defenders behind you because you say, okay, and this goes hand-in-hand hand with their pitching philosophy. Their philosophy is stay in the strike zone, whether it's off speed or not. They've thrown a – I mean, t- uh, Tanner Houck threw 63 mm. strikes in 83 pitches. That has not been him. Ever. 
I think it's the highest percentage yeah. of strikes he's it ever is. thrown in a game. And with the amount of you know strike or pitches he threw, 83. That number of 63 strikes, he's done that with over 100 pitches once or twice. The fact that he did it with just 83 is unreal. And that's for a guy nobody ever thought was going to be able to pound the zone. But when you have the stuff he has, if you can just keep it right there, then you start seeing the strikeouts rack up. That's where you get to 10. That's the Andrew Bailey way. And I also think that this is a, you know, this is part of the new philosophy. Obviously, they want more movement. But it felt to me like how can particular in the game the other night, some of the sliders he threw to me were, you know, they broke. He's got great break on the slider, as we all know. But they were in the middle of the strike zone. And I think what Andrew Bailey has basically said to Tanner Houck is, your slider is so good, you don't have to live on the corners. You don't have to live there. So get it over the plate because you have guys behind you now that can catch it. So don't think you have to strike people out every time. You don't. If you get them, great. And against Oakland, he got 10. But there's no, you know, don't put guys on base and make your life more difficult. With your stuff and your two-seamer, they're going to beat it into the ground and Story will get it. Devers has got pretty good range for a guy his size. As long as he doesn't make sloppy mistakes and he's engaged, he's an average third baseman, let them put the ball in play and let us make plays. And again, it's if you just play simple, it can go a long way, right? It can go a long way. Go ahead. Alice Cora has said the same thing so many times the last two years. If you give a team more than 27 outs, you're going to pay for it. That's how thin the margin of error is, and that's what the Red Sox did again and again. They were playing 30 outs almost every night because you could expect one or two errors. And even in that series finale where they made a couple errors, they still made plays beside that to save the game, whether it was the double play, Rafael's grab in center field. That's the difference. That's what the last two years the Red Sox couldn't do. Now, that said... It hasn't been perfect, okay? I want to touch on some of the mistakes when we come back. Kevin Majori's got your headlines. Sports Hub headlines. I think we're going to fool you every single Friday night on this, match. Well, it keeps it's changing.
reason for analytics. Let's ma let's make that clear, Milliken. You only use analytics, young Tyler over there. You only use analytics when it benefits your argument. You guys say it best, right? You can find an analytic to defend any argument. Absolutely, sure. of course. Yeah, but but again, look, you, you know, uh, all my point is, is I'm just going by my eyeballs. That play that uh, Raffaella made the other night, it's a good play. I'm not telling you it's not a good play. I just don't think it's a great play. Okay, that's semantics. But if you watch the play, he caught the ball without, you know, he... I mean, he was still standing up. He didn't, it's not like he lunged to catch it. He had his arm out extended, but he, he read it off the bat. He ran it down. He made the catch. It was up against the wall. A good outfielder has that ability. A good major league outfielder has that ability. He's going to do that a lot because he is a good major league outfielder. Exactly. So now again, d does that mean I'm dumping on him? Cause I said, he's a legit major league center fielder. Now, does that mean he does he have to be the best of the 32? Like somehow it's an insult to say that, well, he's not number one in the big leagues or that there are another 14, 15 guys that could have made that play, which is what Milliken stat told me. How, why is that insulting to people? Why did they get their back up when you say that? Because is everybody's what, sensitive, Maz. Because what? You're just trying to call it like you see it? So like, yes, look, the kid, and someone called in and asked last night, is he a gold glove caliber player? Yes. My answer so. is yes. Yeah. Now, Early again, on in his career, but he definitely has that ability. Right. Now, typically, those things are political. You have to do it for a couple of years before they start noticing you. Unless you're Fred Lynn in 1975 and you come in and win the MVP as a rookie. I don't count Ichiro as a rookie because he was 27. Okay. Now, again, I, it's just not the same accomplishment winning the MVP at that age. But, but Ichiro was gold glove caliber, too. You can see it right out of the gate. You can tell by just how a guy moves. You know, just watch how he moves. Can he see it? Does he get under it? Does he run it down? What do his hands look like when he catches it? All of it. Is he staggering? Jaron Duran was staggering around out there. And I'll tell you quickly, and again, this is obvious. Tyler O'Neill tracks the ball very well. He's not stumbling around, jumbling around. He sees the ball, he moves over, he floats, and he gets it. So there's no, there's no, no staggered movement. It's all very smooth. That's what you're looking for. That's the stuff you're watching for. He sees it, he tracks it, he catches it, he throws it in. Now, I could do without Tyler O'Neill leaving his feet when he throws a ball to the, the plate. The janitor throw? Man. I hate that. It drives me crazy because it's needless. It's nothing to, it's all it is is a play to show people, look how hard I'm trying. I left my feet when I threw it. Hey, listen, the kid in the Tom Amansky video where they throw it into the bucket, he leaves his feet too, so it has to be right. And right. I, I'll add with Tyler O'Neill, if it's a play where a guy's coming around from second and you're completely airing it out, awesome. Otherwise, please don't with your injury history because the last thing this team needs is you to be out for two or three months, which is a you know regular occurrence in his career. And I'll also add, even with Rafaela being as talented as he is, there's growing pains. You remember in September, there was that game against the Blue Jays. He misread that ball. He cost them a win. It's the reason they didn't get to 79 wins and they were at 78. So he's not going to be perfect. But if you want to be kind of this gold glove player, and it's gotten a little bit better as they understand metrics, if you also don't hit very much, and this shouldn't be part of the equation, but it is, there's a reason Michael A. Taylor, who was one of the best center fielders in baseball the last 10 years, he only has one. JBJ, another guy who was very up and down in terms of offense, only had one. You kind of need to show on that as well, and I think that's going to be the conversation with Rafaela. Can he be a league average hitter this year? Which is sad, right? Because it's supposed to be a defensive award, but it's not. It's just baseball. The, the guys who get them are usually... Best defense from a guy who also supplies offense. Derek Jeter. I mean, that's really <laughs> what the award becomes. Now, just quickly, like, Raffaella. Do you know what his batting average is? He's like 235 or something like that. 217. 217. Oh, that's after the Wednesday game. Yeah, but that's okay. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're not far off. Now, again, what about OPS? What would you guess? Oh, somewhere around 600, 550 at this point. Below 600? 579. Have you noticed? In other words, doesn't it feel like he's contributing? Yeah, because he is contributing. You know, not every player in your lineup needs to be a great hitter. And, you know, I, I argued about this, you know, with Jackie Bradley Jr. for a long time. It's like, if you have a great center fielder, there is value in that. Now, this gets into the rest of the roster, right? They need more production from the rest of the lineup. I have concerns about their lineup, particularly when it comes to right-handed hitters. 
I'm just not counting on that to come from Sadon Rafael. I know he's a right-handed hitter, but he's a rookie. I don't know if he can hit. I don't know if he can hit at the big league level. This is the question coming up, you know, through the system about Rafaela. We knew the glove was good. We didn't know if he could hit. But let me tell you, if you're an eight hitter and you're playing gold glove defense or something close to it in center field, that should be good enough because that helps make your team better. You need to find production elsewhere in the lineup. That's where I'd look for the Red Sox. I mean, it's not unusual to have a guy at a key defensive position who hits below average. Okay. Can he live at two, uh, 217? Uh, can he live at that number? No, he's going to have to hit for a higher average because he's never going to give you more in terms of OBP. It's going to be like a 4% walk rate, best case scenario. That's the guy he was through the minors, and the Red Sox have told you, we don't expect him to start walking. His biggest strength is the ability to consistently put the bat on the ball. The big problem is he chases pitches out of the zone. So that becomes a lot of weak contact over and over. Now you go back from where he was at the end of last year, his chase rate during spring training came down 10%. That's the biggest reason he's on the big league roster. That was the improvement they were hoping for, for him to graduate to the big leagues. So far, have I seen some of the similar chase? I have. But with Rafaela right now, he proved what he needs to do at AAA. He tore the level up. This is where you're going to see the growing pains. I just think this first year, it's going to be a battle for him, but he needs to hit for a higher average. It's just never going to be a high OBP, and he should be able to pop 20 home runs in the big leagues at some point. So let me just ask you this question, because again, Tyler, I, I venture that you've watched every second of every game. I've watched a large majority of the early part of the season, but I have not seen every at bat. The the uh, It feels to me like with Rafaela, the quality of his at bats overall, pretty good. I mean, for what he is. And I'm not telling you that he's a guy who's taking it deep every every count, you know, getting walks, because he's not. He's got one walk. But I haven't looked at him for the most part and said, oh, my God, this guy is, like, out of control in the batter's box. Am I wrong, or, or has it been loose? No, I agree with you. I think that is the right way, because it's not a Trevor Story thing where it's yep. so much swing and miss that you're freaking out. He's going to put the bat on the ball. The K rate's never going to be through the roof. It's 26% right now. Throughout the minor leagues, it was like 20 to 21%. So he's never going to be this big strikeout machine. I think what you're just hoping for is harder contact on a more regular basis, because he's strong for his build. He may look skinny, but he can pound the baseball. Yeah, uh, no, it's it's the weak contact. That's what I've seen from Rafael over the course of the first week. Yeah, I just he doesn't feel overwhelmed to me. I guess is maybe another way to put it. And again, I'll watch him more closely this weekend because uh, again, like for example, a day like uh, not yesterday, the day before, and the games on during the day, I can't see the at bats. There's just too much going on in here that I can't watch the game and do the show at the same time. Can't do Felger and Maz at the same time. So I didn't see every at-bat in that game. I mean, you know, it was a one nothing game, so it's not like all that much happened anyway. But his at-bats don't feel horrendous to me. Now, again, he's got to get into the high 230s, 240s, and with a little bit of power, if he can get that OPS, like, up, you know, up 100 points into the low, uh, high 600s or even just right around 7, just that area, fine. Give him what he is, fine. Now... I said when we went to break, because again, the, uh, you know, all these people's have, habits have changed. So six o'clock on a Friday night, seven o'clock on a Friday night is worse than it used to be because everybody's been home for two hours now instead of one. People leaving their uh, jobs a lot earlier. But looking at the team thus far, five and two, Tyler, you mentioned the defense. Matt, you talked about the players be all being in the right positions, all of which is true. Against Oakland two days ago, they failed to turn two double plays in the last inning. They had uh, a pitcher, forget how many outs there were, Joely Rodriguez in the opener against Seattle. Opening day, there were a couple of missed plays by Abreu in the outfield, one of which helped cost them a game. The other one ended up in an error being charged to Rafaela, who was back in the play up. I still don't think it was his mistake, but whatever. he got. The, it doesn't really matter. The point is Abreu missed the ball again. Did he even put his glove down for the play? He just ran forward. He missed it. He just ran right by it. It was lazy. And it that's, was lazy. That's been Willie Abreu, and I was a big Willie Abreu guy. I'm looking at him. I think it's pretty justified at this point. Once Rob Ruff Snyder's ready, yep. send him down to AAA. He needs to go play every day. It's a waste to treat him like this kind of platoon outfielder with Tyler O'Neill because Cora clearly really likes Tyler O'Neill. He's always talking to him in the dugout. He gives them what they want on defense, on the base paths, and he's that right-handed bat. Well, Rafaela changed this equation when he made the big league team. Send Abreu down to AAA because at some point this year, you're going to need him back up. Or worse comes to worse, when the deadline gets here and Roman Anthony's knocking on the door to get called up, 
You're going to have to start moving at least one of these outfielders or two. The worst thing you can do is tank his value while he's sitting on the bench most days in the big leagues. I'm in complete agreement, Millick, and I think you have to send him down. There's too much of a log jam in the outfield. And Rafaela coming up and playing big league defense in center field has totally changed, to me, the complexion of the team. Yeah, look, again, it's made a difference. Up the middle, Matt, as you yeah. said, right? Shortstop's good. Center field's good. Catcher, for the most part, has been good. Although, those two double plays, one of them was Trevor Story who threw the ball away. Yep. So, you know, Story made a mistake in there, too. I like Story defensively. We all do. There's athleticism there. I get it. To me, he's one of the more overrated players in baseball Agreed. over the last five, ten years. Draw the line wherever you want. I don't even know how long his career is. This is year probably nine for him, I guess. But I think he's been overrated. But that aside, I've never said he sucks defensively. Never, ever, ever. To me, he's a guy that's easy to get out if you pitch him properly. But, again, the failed double plays, the mistakes in the outfield, you had a couple of guys run into outs on the bases, one of which was a caught stealing Raffaella that uh, uh, Cora said he started to go and then stopped. I thought it was a design play. Clearly it was not. Cost him a run. And then what was the other? Uh, Abreu on the bases getting picked off second base. Duran ran into an out in Oakland to yeah, try to stretch. Right, right. Yeah. exactly right. So yeah. I guess what I'm saying is you look at it, they've only played seven games. We just rattled off about seven mistakes. So one a game is too many to make those kinds of mistakes. True or false? Had they not been playing Oakland, they'd have been burned by some of those mistakes in, the, in those games. I'll tell you right now, if they weren't playing Oakland, they probably win one of those three games. I agree. Couldn't agree more. I, I, think, I think their problems, and in some ways the talent, you know, showed up in Oakland. They didn't hit enough. Uh, you know, Valdez makes it, you know, what could have been a huge error um, because he's not a big league second baseman. I think he can hit a little bit, but he's not a big league second baseman. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of their problems have shown up here. I mean, they're five and two, right? There, there's been a lot of good in that five and two, um, but it's not all great. Uh by any stretch of the imagination. And I think that's where the talent of the team comes into play. They're, they're still not that good a baseball team. They've been functional, but I don't know how good they are. I mean, people wanted to say to me quickly, they could have won three out of four in Seattle, which I would agree with. They also could have lost two out of three in, o two out of three in Oakland. Uh, Jimmy, quickly, Jared Krabis won from the other night. Do you believe in the pitching staff? I do. But there's, it's, that it's hard to... That was not a convincing I do. I do because... Here, here's why. Let me explain, Tony. I believe in it not because of the results. I believe in it because there is a plan. And it's tangible. You can see it. I think if we were to open the season and whatever it was coming into last night, they had the lowest ERA in the sport. Um, and it's like, okay, but you look at this year compared to last year and there's no difference then you're kind of just like, well, it's a fluke. It's the teams that they're playing, whatever. But when you look under the hood, there's a difference. It, 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 since, what is it, 2008, they've thrown the, the lowest number of four-seam fastballs of any team in, in the game. So like the fact that it's not so much that I'm buying into them dominating the Mariners, who uh, I think they were 22nd in hitting in the league last year, and this Oakland A's team is is not even a real baseball team. They shouldn't. They, it's just it's a bunch of single A players. It really is kind of embarrassing. Um, not kind of it is. It is. Uh, so you can't gauge too much off of the competition so far. But what you can do is look and see: Do they have a philosophy? Is there a direction that they're going in that's different from where they were? last year and the answer is absolutely yes okay so just quickly if we can do you believe in the philosophy tyler but you got to keep it tight 100 percent, because the orioles are doing the same thing if you're talking about fastball percentage this year the red Sox are the lowest at 29.9 percent who's the only team right next to them all time since 2007 the orioles right now i believe in the philosophy i don't know if i believe in the durability or maybe the high-end talent I think so, it's good, but I don't think it's good enough. So this is the concern. You can call for all the breaking balls you want or off speed. You still got to put them in the strike zone and you got to stay healthy, which are two different things. Fellas, thank you. Anytime. Appreciate it. Okay, we're going to wrap it up. Celtics pregame coming up next. Max and Grandy followed by Celtics and Sacramento Kings right here on 98.5.